That thing to work so much. Sure, what happened, but something happened somewhere. All right. Good evening. All right. All right, good evening, everybody. And thank you for being here. Welcome to a conversation between professor and preacher. I'm Reverend Rebecca Burrow. I am the founder and CEO of Building Reconciliation, Inclusion, Diversity, and Gender Equity. Before I uh, introduce our speakers for this evening, I would just like to take a minute to uh, make sure that we celebrate the lives and honor the lives and contributions of uh, civil rights leader C.T. Vivian and Congressman John Lewis. Both men committed their lives to the work of civil rights for the sole purpose of ensuring that life in these United States would be a place of equality and equity for all human beings. We can honor them by making sure that we exercise our rights to vote. So at the end of our conversation this evening, um, Dr. Burrow and Marcus will be available to answer some of your questions. Make sure you drop your questions in the comments section and I'll monitor that throughout the conversation. So let me introduce our speakers. First, Reverend Marcus Derek White. He currently serves as the executive pastor of Allen Temple African Methodist Episcopal Church in Tampa, Florida under the leadership of Reverend Dr. Glenn B. Dames, Jr. Reverend White attended Southern University in Lakeland, Florida, 
And currently he is pursuing a Master of Divinity degree from United Theological Seminary in uh, Dayton, Ohio. Reverend White pastored a small rural Baptist church in Florida for three and a half years. He also taught as a middle school history and science teacher for five years. He is the proud husband to Yolanda, Nicole, and they have two sons. Now I asked Marcus or Reverend Marcus, he, he's my brother, so I can call him Marcus. Um, I asked him to be a part of this conversation on this evening because I know him to be a tremendous preacher. Um, about 10 years ago, it was when I heard Mike, uh, Marcus preach for the very first time. And uh, I remember the sermon and I remember the word that he brought on that day. And I have watched him grow into a dynamic preacher that's celebrated throughout the country. So I wanted him to be part of this conversation for that reason, but also because I know him to also be curious. And uh, because he is a curious person, he loves to read and he loves to learn. So I thought that it would be a great opportunity for him to sit down and have a conversation with Dr. Burrow on this evening. Our next conversationalist for this evening is Dr. Rufus Burrow Jr. And when I asked him what um, would he want me to say about him, he said, well, tell him I'm, uh, uh, I was a poor black boy who grew up in the projects on the west side of Pontiac, Michigan. So I've said it. <laughs> Dr. Rufus Burrow Jr. is the Indiana Professor of Christian Thought and Professor of Theological and Social Ethics Emeritus. He taught at Christian Theological Seminary for 32 years. While at CTS, he was one of the most sought out professors and one of the most revered. He is an advocate. He was an advocate for his colleagues and he served on many um, committees as a professor there at CTS. He is a keen scholar and has authored more than 15 books. And he has co-authored several books as well. In addition, he has written several dozens of journal articles. Dr. Burrow developed uh, the curriculum for and taught the Black Church Leadership Program for United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities. And although he no longer teaches in an academic setting, he continues to teach, mentor, and advise pastors, ministers, and students. He is always available for their calls, and he is always available for their emails, and they do uh, reach out to him because they trust him as a leader. So, oh, and by the way, yeah, he's married to Reverend Rebecca Burrow. So, <laughs> uh, and and shout out to uh, Bailey Rain and Sharon, Sharon Lynn, uh, Dr. Burrow's daughter and Bailey, his granddaughter. I know that they are listening. This gives Bailey an opportunity to see her, her pappy in action on the night. So we appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Burrow and Reverend Marcus for agreeing to be the conversationalists for this evening. I appreciate your time and I am excited as uh, you all sit and just talk to one another. So we're gonna be listening and we know that this conversation will be rich and filled with wisdom. I'm gonna bow out now. Marcus. I want uh, you to start the conversation. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Burrow, uh, thank you for your time. Um, we know that Rebecca has given us a brief bio, um, but I think I, I'm, after reading your books, um, interaction with you, uh, conversations with you, uh, you donating three fourths of my own personal library uh, I feel like I know you, uh, but I think our audience um, would like to get a glimpse uh, of who you are. Uh, and so I uh, just wanted to uh, ask you to share uh, a bit about your story, your upbringing, uh, who you are and how you've become who you are today. Okay, Marcus, thank you. And before I do that, um, I don't know if I ever told you that I also attended the United Theological Seminary. It was only for a year. Mm -hmm. And it happened um, uh, the year after I graduated from what is now Anderson University, then Anderson College, mm -hmm. Church of God School mm -hmm. in Anderson, Indiana. And um, I became a probation officer 
in Dayton, Ohio. And one day uh, around lunchtime, the chaplain at the probation office uh, stopped by and asked me if I wanted to ride down to the seminary with him. Well, I wasn't familiar with, uh, with uh, UTS at that time. Didn't know that there was a seminary in the city. Right. At any rate, I decided I'd go with him. And I did that and um, uh, met the uh, dean uh, at the time who was new and worked. And it turns out that the dean was a Boston University PhD. Wow. Um, and somehow or other, he talked me into taking a couple of classes at at United, and um, based on that experience, to then decide whether or not I wanted to enter on a degree program. And I didn't do that, but I did enroll in a couple of classes, one of which was entitled uh, The Black Religious Experience, mm. which I took with uh, Charles Brown. Uh, Dr. Brown was a, uh, a local Baptist preacher and also the recipient of the THD degree from Boston University. Wow. Uh, and it was Dr. Brown who, in fact, um, invited James Cone, the premier black theologian, yes, yes. Uh, to be a guest lecturer wow. at the seminary one evening. And that's how I first, how and when I first met James Hal Cohn. Wow. And our experience uh, with each other continued really <clears throat> uh, over the years, although it would be many years before I would see and speak with him again. Um, uh, and that, in fact, happened in um, Chicago around 1984, shortly after the publication of his book, For My People. Yes, yes. He had invited me to a meeting of the uh, Black Theology Project. And um, I was going to be his guest and was very happily surprised to discover that on the day he and I was to have had lunch, I thought it was going to be a group thing, but he limited it to just he and me. Wow. Uh, and he uh, talked with me and counseled me that day for about an hour and 30 minutes uh, over lunch uh, about how to survive in a predominantly white seminary, CPS, yes. as at that time the only African American professor, the only professor of color on the faculty. Wow. And of course, Colin himself had been through that experience at Adrian College uh, in Michigan. Uh, and uh, he did share a number of things with me uh, that afternoon as he gulped down uh, the equivalent of a bottle of wine because I didn't drink. Right. Uh, so, but uh, I did notice that the more of that wine he drank, the more talkative uh, he got, and um, you know he was just filled with laughter, laughter, and and really good wisdom for me. So, but anyway, having said that, uh, let me um, uh, say just a quick word about uh, this uh, conversation to, uh, this evening and the theme. Uh, you know, and, and just a word about the significance of this conversation between a black pastor mm -hmm. and a black theologian. Yeah. Uh, because when Rebecca asked me if I would be willing to participate in this, I thought immediately about a couple of things uh, that has happened to me in my uh, career over the years. And um, uh, one of them, of course, uh, had very much to do with CTS. Okay. Back in about the mid 1980s, uh, uh, let's see, CTS uh, got involved with a a program that was funded by the Lilly Endowment. It was mm -hmm. um, uh, Light of the World Christian Church, the large disciples church in Indianapolis, was the recipient of a large grant from the Lilly Endowment. Uh, and uh, Tom Benjamin, who was the pastor at that time, had developed a pretty interesting leadership development program for black clergy and lay people. Uh, we call it the Midwest Christian Training Center. And Benjamin, uh, a persistent rascal, was able to get me, uh, still a relatively new professor at CPS at that time, was able to talk me into being the coordinator or director of uh, the um, uh, training center. 
And uh, so I agree with you that. And uh, one of the things he wanted added to that program, though, was a component that he called the pastor professor program. And his interest, of course, was that uh, he had attended CTS himself to get his MDiv and then his DMIN degree. Uh, so he knew CTS and the faculty there quite well, knew that there was a lot of uh, a racial insensitivity, cultural insensitivity, and all of the rest. And he believed uh, that CTS could be a great resource for the Black churches uh, in the city. And I, I agreed with that when he talked to me about the idea. Uh, and so at any rate, we uh, added that component of the pastor professor program. And what we essentially did was to pair a local black preacher with one of the seminary professors. Uh, and I had a person as well. And we met on a weekly to bi-weekly basis, you know, as, as the individual teams, a couple. Uh, and then periodically we'd get together, everybody, you know, the faculty and the pastor. Uh, either at CTS or one of the local churches. And that really did turn out to be a very good way of working at some of those issues, the racial insensitivity and cultural kinds of issues and concerns that black pastors had and wanted to be certain that the seminary professors heard. And then of course the seminary professors uh, themselves expressed you know, their concerns. Uh, so it turned out to be a pretty good uh, a pretty good experience. Sometimes it got pretty heated, you know, especially when we got together in the larger group. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, one almost got sent sometime that people weren't tight. Uh, but, you know, it was all kind of funny to me because I just know that uh, when working on difficult issues like that, you know, the emotions get involved and all of that. And uh, at any rate, you know, long story short, uh, it uh, ultimately ended up being a pretty good experience. Uh, if not as much for the black churches, certainly for CTS. Yeah. Uh, and then the second time that uh, I ran into that same issue, uh, the question between black pastors and uh, uh, professors, seminary professors, centered around black theology. And you must know yourself, having been affiliated with the church as long as you have been, that uh, most black preachers generally don't get black theology. Right. Okay? And most of them also think that most black theologians, and particularly that first generation with James Cone, Gildas Roberts, Major Jones, those people, uh, think that essentially, you know, those ones were churchless guys <laughs> who had given up their religion and the Bible and all of that stuff none of which was true, but you know, that was the perception that a lot of black preachers had in those days. And my sense is a lot of them still have it today. Mm. They don't know black theology. They've never read it. They've heard right. about it. Right. Uh, but hearing about it is certainly not quite the same as having read and studied it yeah. and or uh, having sat in classrooms and actually discussed it. Uh, so I find that there's still that kind of uh, tension, you know, even from the uh, 19, late 1960s, 70s, and uh, throughout the 1980s, uh, when we still have a kind of tension uh, between the Black theologians, including the womanist theologians, and the Black churches, okay? And so one of my wishes and hopes has always been that somehow or other we, can, we could figure out how to begin addressing that issue. Now, it's not to say that there have not been individual cases in which a black theologian and pastor here and there mm -hmm. have not really been on the same page and have been good dialogue partners, have respected each other as human beings, and have respected each other's work uh, and all of the rest. And I certainly know some pastors who are very well read in the area of black theology and other African American literature. Uh, but my sense is that there's still are not, still is not enough of that going on today. And so my hope is that uh, somehow or other we can get that changed. But I see the hope for that being in 
what we ultimately want to be talking about in the younger pastor. Those in your generation, for example, there's absolutely no excuse for you all not working at this because right. you can see what the problem, what the issue is. Uh, and if uh, the younger pastors um, you know, don't get caught up in what Martin Luther King used to refer to as jumboism, you know, those who feel like, well, God called me to ministry, but no, God didn't just call me to ministry, God called me to develop a big black church with a big, with a whole lot of members. You see what I'm saying? So you all know that that really is not what it's about. Right. So God doesn't call ministers to develop jumbo sized congregations. My sense has always been if the calling is genuine and if you're really committed to the call and to the faith, well, then the ministry will grow. And whether it grows in numbers, mm -hmm. the important thing at the end of the day is that it grows in quality because the object is to expose the people, those people that you all are presumably the shepherds of, to expose them to the truth of the gospel and to the truth of the Hebrew prophets. Amen. And if you do Amen. those things and do them well and faithfully, and I think the churches, even their numbers, will grow because what the people outside the churches want, and especially today, today more than any time in my lifetime, people want to hear the truth. You know, we get lies, as you well know, from everywhere today. You know, one of the stupidest people on the planet uh, who lives at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue well, Dr. Burrow. just yeah. lies so much that people want to hear the truth. Right. And if nowhere else, they should be able to hear it in religious establishments, churches, synagogues, mosques, and so forth. Go ahead. Okay. I think one of the greatest things that you said um, uh, that I that I want to quickly piggyback off on, and then want to ask a, an important question is uh, in the fact that yeah, we we know that Cone definitely was was not only hated by white evangelicals, but then even misunderstood in the black church right. um, by pastors. And it's amazing um, in the fact that he is preaching a gospel um, that is colorized and contextualized for us as black people and how he is ostracized for the preaching of that. Uh, and that was just so amazing to me. And, and I could stay all day on a conversation with you and Cone, but I know uh, I know Rebecca's gonna kill me. So I do wanna ask you how, how did, and even why did you uh, become an avid writer on Dr. King? Okay, well, now look, I um, did my um, uh, doctoral work at Boston University. Right. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to go to Boston primarily because of something that I accidentally happened upon or crossed in the stacks, in the library stacks at United Theological Seminary. Uh, one evening uh, uh, during class break, I was in the stacks and just, you know, walking up and down the aisles and I pull a book off the shelf from time to time that looked interesting. And I pulled the book off uh, the shelf one evening that was by Edgar Sheffield Brightman entitled A Philosophy of Religion and began reading that book and <clears throat> unsuspecting discovered that um, uh, he had uh, proposed a very radical, provocative, and different way of thinking about God and evil. So that while the traditional view was that uh, and still is for most folk, is that God is omnipotent mm -hmm. and omnibenevolent. Mm -hmm. And Brightman had problems with that and uh, just couldn't, it just didn't make sense to him that people kept saying that God was all powerful and all loving and there were certain types of evils in the world that we were having difficulties you know, getting rid of. But at any rate, long story short, Brightman comes up with this hypothesis of what he called the finite, infinite God. I'll leave that there for now. What I knew uh, after I picked up that book, I recognized Brightman's name uh, immediately because 
uh, I had taken a course, I had done a guided research at the Anderson School of Religion uh, with uh, um, uh, the academic dean there. And so I knew that King had gotten his PhD at Boston University and that Brightman had been his advisor before Brightman so unexpectedly died. Um, and so I wanted to go to Boston University after I saw Brightman's book, primarily because King went there. And I also knew that King had studied this thing, this philosophy of personalism under Brightman. So I knew that two of Brightman's students, at least two of them, were still at Boston University, although they weren't teaching full time. Peter Bertacci and Walter Mulder. Mulder had been King's um, uh, a mentor and advisor. Uh, Dr. Bertacci uh, had taught King a seminar on Hegel. Uh, so at any rate, I, wanted, I was hoping that I'd be able to get a chance to uh, uh, study under those two uh, uh, personalists. And, um, you know, I was blessed. I was able to, uh, uh, to do that. But once again, it was at, at United, you know, that I discovered something that uh, led me to the next step of my journey. And I had no sense, no idea as to where I was really headed uh, at that time. But uh, ultimately, when I did get into uh, BU uh, and did my doctoral work there and was able to get the uh, dissertation uh, defended, I had written a dissertation on Brightman's doctrine of God and evil. Uh, and I did that primarily because all my life, having grown up in the Church of God, you may know Church of God is a very conservative group, uh, but having grown up in that group, I mean, I just couldn't. I couldn't live with uh, the uh, the understanding of God that I got through yeah. that group. Uh, so at any rate, uh, that's where it all started for me. I took a course on Martin Luther King, which was actually required of PhD students in social ethics at, B at BU at wow. that time. <clears throat> and once I finished and uh, you know got my degree and then got that appointment at CTS, I decided, well, I'm not going to be writing on King, though, because I'd read enough to know that oodles of things had been written, you know, on and about Martin Luther King dissertations and certainly uh, just dozens and dozens of articles and chapters and books and books as well, right. even by that time in the early 1980s. Uh, so I decided that I wasn't going to focus on King at all. Um, and um, when time came for me to um, uh, to write my first book, I was strongly encouraged to you know revise my dissertation uh, for publication. But I didn't want to do that at the time. I wanted to do something that would be new to me, uh, and so I decided to write my first book on James Cone, uh, anticipating the tenure review process. You know, at CTS, CTS is one of those places where, you know, you either publish or you perish. Um, but fortunately for me, in 1984, I, you know, met James Cone for the second time mm -hmm. when he invited me to come to Chicago for the Black Theology Project. It was during my conversation with him over lunch that he instilled in me the importance of being a writing and publishing African-American scholar. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was just absolutely livid about it. You talk about somebody getting excited uh, about the importance of Black scholars writing because his sense, as well as J.D. Otis Roberts and Major Jones's, uh, was that Black religious scholars simply did not write and right. publish enough. Right. And in my judgment, we still don't do it quite enough, but right. certainly we do a lot more now than we did it uh, during that first generation of Black theologians. But at any rate, uh, Cone insisted to me, in fact, I remember him saying, so I want you to write, he said. And he said, when you get tired, I want you to write some more. <laughs> and when you sometimes feel like you just can't stand it, I want you to write. And when you feel like you can't even hold your pen in your hand, I want you to write some more. Mm -hmm. And then he said, if you do that and do it faithfully, 
and it won't be easy, he said, because most of us don't write. But he said, if you're faithful at doing that, if you learn to make writing a discipline yeah. so that you come to understand that as an academic, writing is what you do. Right. Right. Yes, you teach, but writing is teaching too. Writing is expanding your classroom, he said. If you do that faithfully, he said, the next thing before you know it, you'll have publications all over the place. And in some instances, things will come out uh, that you published and you will have forgotten that you even submitted them for publication. Because the truth is, sometimes it takes editors a very long time, you know, to, to get our work back to us. So that's basically how the writing started for me. And I understood right away the, uh, <clears throat> of the importance of that, not only for my tenure, you know, if I was ever going to be tenured, I needed to write. Uh, but the more I wrote, and the more I felt a sense of discipline about it, you know, the more I began to feel that I can't go, go through any week without sitting at my desk and trying to do some writing. I learned that from James Hal Cone and also from those two old white men at Boston University who were my teachers par excellence, Peter Bertacci and Walter Mulder. Because just like Cone encouraged me on the front end of my career to write, 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 those two old white men did the exact same thing. Uh, and I appreciate uh, that to this day. And you know, writing is not easy. Yeah. Uh, it's like I, I used to tell my junior colleagues, it's like really having a second full-time job. And so it really will take discipline and determination to get it done. I have never, ever liked to hear a professor say to me, I don't have the time or it's hard. So, but yes, it is hard, but it's what we do. If you call to a work, if you call to pastor and you do the hard things, you may not know how to do it all the time. But you spend your days trying to figure out how to get it done. That's your responsibility. That's what you do as a pastor. As a professor, that's what I do. I write. And now that, uh, you know, I, I along with uh, seven of my other colleagues who were great uh, professors and scholars, <clears throat> Uh, and we had to take early buyouts so that uh, we all ended up in early retirement. I know that uh, some of those colleagues had not, you know, had the wherewithal, the strength, perhaps the energy, uh, and perhaps even the desire to continue writing and publishing. But I have to do that. It's what I do. Um, I, uh, and I encourage even uh, those who are pastors. You know, I've got a student out in Denver, Colorado, right now, Reggie Holmes. Reggie is a disciple, pastor, very eloquent preacher, and he's, a, he's just brilliant. I mean, he has a brilliant mind uh, for things theological. He's an excellent thinker. Um, and, uh, you know, even Reggie um, spends his time editing his sermons. He's made a discipline of writing out every sermon that he does and with the understanding that, you know, at some point he uh, will get around to and in fact has already gotten around to pulling together one collection of his sermons, but he will sit down and edit those sermons uh, in the hope of getting uh, them published for other pastors so that he can teach them too what goes into a good solid sermon sermons generally that are based upon the prophetic tradition of the church. I, I think writing is key, and I think it's a lost art, um, especially among uh, African-American uh, preachers, um, as you alluded to. And I think uh, that's a challenge that a few of my friends, uh, fraternal friends, uh, uh, that we've tried to challenge one another with 
especially in the manuscript uh, of our sermons and so forth. So Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. Burrow, you, you've written so uh, many, um, and I'm probably overstating that, but uh, or maybe even understating uh, King books. Um, my favorite one, uh, it may seem even elementary, um, but the armchair theologian of uh, that King portion is my favorite book of yours uh, that you've written. I'm grateful for the book that I just received in the mail uh, the other week from Rebecca, your latest publication. But uh, the, the book that we're tasked uh, to tonight uh, is uh, A Child uh, uh, Shall Lead Them. Uh, and it really uh, talks about um, young people and their contribution uh, in the civil rights movement. Um, I bought this book on iBooks. I, I love it uh, because I think it speaks to the times that we're in right now. Um, and I want to I want to kind of get into that, um, uh, given that the book highlights once again major contributions of youth and young people within the civil rights movement. Uh, how do you feel about the millennial and Generation uh, Z uh, leading the movement or being at the forefront of the Black Lives Movement? Well, they had a great bunch of um, uh, <clears throat> cousins to model that for them. The cousins, yeah. of course, being young people during the civil rights movement. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we know that uh, during that period, you know, it wasn't just black students, although right. black students uh, certainly, you know, um, led the way uh, in that regard from Montgomery onward. Right. Uh, you know, black students were out front. And of course, uh, well, at the time that, that uh, white students really began to, uh, to get seriously uh, involved uh, began to happen well around the time of the uh, the sit-ins and the freedom rides uh, and that kind of thing and then of course you know who can forget uh, Freedom Summer uh, in 1964 uh, <clears throat> when uh, white um, uh, students of the north all over the country uh, began responding positively to the calls the summonses from these black student leaders, you know, to come and join us in the canvassing and all of the rest and, and trying to get uh, black people registered to vote in places like the Mississippi Delta and other parts of the Deep South. <clears throat> and those young people uh, began uh, going down in, uh, in pretty great numbers. You know, they went over to Ohio uh, to get some training and Bob Moses and some of the others came up uh, to, uh, to actually do the training before Freedom Summer was to begin. And uh, of course, a good many of the uh, parents of those uh, white kids uh, and no doubt grandparents and spiritual advisors and pastors, friends, and others strongly discouraged right. them from, right. from going and, and joining that, that movement at the time because they knew, the parents knew, precisely what the black students knew. Uh, namely that, uh, you know, what was happening to them in Mississippi and other places would now begin happening to the kids of those white parents. Uh, but to their credit, those young people defied their parents and other white authorities and they went anyway. And I like to think that they went primarily because, well, of a couple of things. First, uh, because they did feel kind of a sense of calling and a sense of, you know, this being about something bigger than themselves, being about something like justice. And I also think that in their own youthful ways, I think that some of those white kids figured out you know, what we have learned from personalists like Martin Luther King, from Ubuntu theorists like Archbishop Desmond Tutu, you know, that what happens to them actually happens to me, right? Uh, if they do it to them, they do it to me. And, um, you know, they obviously did not understand the... Uh, you know, the philosophy behind that, but it was a good gut response 
uh, to uh, the invitation that they received from these black leaders, <clears throat> young black leaders. Uh, and so, you know, they went on over to Ohio, got their training and all of the rest. And of course, when the first um, uh, uh, two or three young people left to go down to the Delta from Mississippi, happened to have been, um, you know, Andrew um, Goodman and Michael Schwerner, Mickey Schwerner, uh, and then, of course, James Cheney, the African American. Right. The other two guys were Jewish young people. Right, right. And unfortunately, uh, you know, on the day that um, Freedom Summer was to begin, they disappeared. Now, <clears throat> the kids and Miss, uh, the kids who had been down to the Delta knew that Mississippi, of all of the deep southern states at that time, that none was more violent, more vicious, more dangerous. And Mississippi. And so they had a saying, the leaders, and you know, they, they would tell all of the kids who'd come down, you know, when they had their orientation. In, in Mississippi, if you disappear, you're dead. Yeah. Okay? And so the advice was always that they would have a buddy system. They were never to go anywhere in the Delta without a buddy or two or three or four. And of course we know now, or they found out really the first day of Freedom Summer, that even if you were two buddies, you can disappear. And of course those three young fellows uh, disappeared and it was true. You know, what Bob Moses and the other leaders suspected, didn't want to believe, but suspected that they'd been murdered and it was so. When the white, some of the white parents began hearing about that kind of stuff, of course, they were in touch with their kids and did everything they could to get them to leave and come home where it'd be safe. Once again, to their credit, those white kids stayed. And essentially what they were saying was, not only if they do it to them, they, they will do it, they do it to me. But if they do it to them, they've got to do it to me mm. because I'm not leaving. Well, and they didn't. Now, some funny things happened uh, down in Mississippi as well. And it causes, it causes me to chuckle every time I, I think about it, you know, because there are always those clowns or those people who do things to make you laugh, uh, no matter how difficult, how tough things are going for you. And, uh, you know, Mississippi uh, and those young people in the movement had some of those folks with them. And it just so happened that some of the white kids, uh, you know, there was one kid, Chris Williams was his name. <clears throat> Chris happened to have been the, the youngest of the canvassers, you know, going door to door down in the Delta trying to get people signed up to register. Uh, and so, you know, being one of the, being the young kid on the block, as it were, literally, uh, you know, Chris had a way of, he, he cussed a lot, cursed a lot. And of course, when he'd get to cursing, uh, and I know even in my experience today, I still hear white people cursing uh, sometimes. And, you know, a few of them are people that I know pretty well, and they just crack the hell out of me. You know, when I listen to the way they curse. <clears throat> but Chris had a way of doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, one day when they were um, uh, in the courthouse and uh, they'd run into some trouble and uh, Chris, of course, got a little bit unruly and the sheriff made him leave. And, of course, he didn't want to, uh, but he left and probably, you know, I picture him in my mind's eye and I can see him turning red as a tomato. Because what happens is, you know, he's walking towards the door and there's a long line of people, black people. And so it was later reported that as Chris walked by, headed to the door to leave the courthouse, that different people could hear him saying, talking about the sheriff, 
goddamn motherfucker pissed me right off. And he paused and then said it again, goddamn motherfucker pissed me off. And of course, people were laughing and, you know, just couldn't control themselves and all of the rest. And I'm just saying that, you know, it's interesting to me how uh, even during that time, you know, and, and I always uh, uh, think that, you know, God had something to do with it. You know, the people needed some way to relieve, to relieve some of the tension. And so periodically, God sends a cloud to give us a little bit of humor and to help us to make it one more day. And in this case, in my judgment, it happened to be this young white boy who was still in high school, Chris Wheat. Goddamn motherfucker. Pissed me off. So seeing that we see both uh, a great component of black and whites getting involved in the civil rights movement, what do you think Dr. King would say nowadays, seeing millennials, both black, white, LGBTQ, um, and this conglomerate of people coming together and expressing that black lives do matter? What do you think his words would be? Would it be words of encouragement? Uh, would he say, like you said in your book, uh, that he just got an air and, and, a, and a sense of encouragement when he came around these young people? because of their tenacity. What would Dr. King's uh, words be to, once again, these millennials and Generation Zs uh, who are marching um, sit-ins, who are walking on the interstates and protesting and crying aloud that this must end, that not only do all lives matter, but most specifically that Black lives matter? I think that uh, very much, uh, he would very much uh, say essentially what you said yourself. Uh, he would very much, I think, say, what uh, the late Congressman John Lewis uh, said as well. Uh, and of course, we know that uh, John uh, was so impressed, so thrilled, you know, by what he witnessed these young people doing. Um, and he was certainly uh, super thrilled about the fact that this time around, it wasn't just primarily African-American and white kids and people of all ages, yeah. to be quite frank. But as for these young people, it wasn't just those two groups, but it was, as you said, the Latinx and, you know, it was the native people of this country, it was the Asian-American young people. Um, you know, it was those with, uh, in, um, different sexual orientations and all of the rest. Uh, you know, that was more than, I like to say, more than even a rainbow yeah. of God's people. And of course, that too is what we have to, to recognize, you know, namely that all of these are God's people. Uh, and um, so I think that, uh, that King, as well as, uh, you know, the... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, Dr. Lowry and, you know, of course, uh, Congressman Lewis and C.T. Vivian and others who have transitioned to the other side, uh, that all of them supremely impressed. Uh, uh, and those who had gone on before John Lewis, they would be super impressed. Yeah. So, and not just Dr. King, yeah. but all of them. You know, to know that these young people today, you know, I like to say that the uh, young people during the civil rights movement and the Black Lives movement yeah. are really movements of a peace. The movement never really yeah. ended. Yeah. There was yeah. a pause for a minute. Yeah. But there was no defeat. The defeat happens when people decide that they aren't gonna protest anymore, that they aren't gonna march yeah. anymore. And to these young people's credit, for those who have actually been involved in the movement, they've done it nonviolent. Yeah. Regardless yeah. of what 
the stupid people have been saying. Right. They have been right. nonviolent. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, and so I think that you know that's one of the things that uh, King and other uh, leaders of the civil rights movement, the adult leaders, would be most impressed about today. And my sense in, in observing these young people, Marcus, is that at least up to this moment, they ain't going to let nobody or no thing yeah. turn yeah. them on. Yeah, I agree. I wholeheartedly agree. Shifting gears, I know Rebecca's going to come back in and do the question and answering session. One last question, Dr. Burrow. Uh, along the same vein, uh, but kind of shifting gears a little, uh, we know that the civil rights movement was led uh, largely by the church and specifically by uh, ministers of the gospel. Uh, what do you think, uh, or why do you think it is uh, that in this movement, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, that the church, our preachers and our pastors are not at the forefront, uh, but rather uh, young people, as your book would allude, uh, who were maybe second uh, in in leadership in the civil rights movement, but now we're first. Why, why do you think that is? Well, you know, the truth of the matter is, <clears throat> although the um, black church mm -hmm. was a big part of the leadership of the civil rights movement, there's no doubt about that. <clears throat> but we have to remember, however, that it was not all black churches. It mm -hmm. was not even most black churches. Right, right. Nobody complained about the black church's dereliction in the 1960s during the civil rights movement more than Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he was constantly after his black church colleagues. The National Convention. Involved right. And all of the rest. So, uh, and, you know, as for, you know, I, I, you know, the truth is for me, I'm not particularly mm -hmm. concerned that the black churches are not doing the leading right now. I'm not certain that they can. Mm -hmm. right now because I don't see Wow. The level of commitment. Wow. For that kind of ministry, first of all. Wow. And secondly, I recognize that even in the civil rights movement, when many churches were involved, that there were a, a whole lot of non churched black people mm -hmm. who were involved in the leadership and just, you know, the, the uh, protest marches. Wow. and all of the rest in large numbers. And I think that there's a lot of that obviously going on today. Yeah. I don't know how many of those young people uh, who are actively involved in churches, my hunch is that it's not many. Mm. Uh, my hunch is yeah. that a lot of them probably grew up in the church yes. or at least had grandparents Yes. who grew up in the church and who taught them some things about what it means to be religious, what it means to be Christian, but that these young people themselves don't know a whole lot about the churches. So these are really the non-churched leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think that at the end of the day, while God is going to hold responsible those churches, ministers especially, but church members too, who sat back and did nothing but complain yeah. that God's going to call them out and hold them responsible for that. Yeah. But I also believe that a lot of those non-church folks who are engaged in this particular type of ministry are going to be the ones to make it to heaven mm. if there is such a place. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Burrow. I appreciate our conversation. Listen, I know we could go on more and more and more, but I see that my sister, uh, my ministry mother has come back on, and so we'll give way to her for question and answering session. Okay. Such a rich discussion. Um, and I appreciate uh, you, Reverend Marcus, for 
posing some very good questions um, that allowed Dr. Burrell to go deep in his reservoir of knowledge and wisdom. Uh, Dr. Burrell, Rufus Burrell Jr., thank you so much for sharing this evening. I appreciate it. Now, you know that Bailey Rain heard her pappy say some words. <laughs> Her mommy will check her. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, now now Sharon's going to have to explain why Pappy was saying those words. <laughs> but anyway, I thank you. We do have a, a question, and, and the, I believe that the one question, the uh, last question that uh, Marcus posed to you was a question from Pastor Isaac Lane. Is that correct, Marcus? Actually, no. Uh, but oh, okay. since he's my brother and my seminary friend, I'm sure it was on the same vein. It was, it was the same, yes, yes, right. but I'll ask it again. But there's another question from Susan who asked, she says, uh, Dr. Eddie Glaude of Princeton has said the black church is dead. How do you understand his wow. charge and what is your response to it? Dr. Well, I don't quite know exactly how to respond uh, to Professor Glaude. I do not believe, however, that the black church is dead. Now, I don't believe that. Right. With all of the criticisms that I have of the black church, I know enough, and Eddie does too, about the black church and its history, its struggles, and all of the rest. And the fact that, you know, when we had no other institution, mm -hmm. when even the black family was threatened from slavery on, that was the black church. Okay? Okay. Uh, so I don't think the black church as such. Uh, is dead. Okay. I do think that the black church, uh, particularly in, in from the standpoint of its leaders, the pastors, the judicatories, bishops, superintendents, and all of the rest, I do think that they are failing. Okay. Uh, but I don't think that um, uh, the church itself has completely uh, fallen and that it is now <clears throat> dead and right. only waiting for the funeral and the burial. Okay. All right, we have another to, question. Okay. Can I touch on that just very, very yeah, quickly? Just, just smaller. Mm -hmm. and, and I think when we say black church, we, we, we say it in such a monolithic way. Um, um, and I don't think that, that, that the black church is monolithic in, in essence. But I think when we see uh, such a small uh, category of the black church um, in mainstream uh, media, that we categorize that as the black church. Um, but I honestly see um, so many churches uh, uh, that are starched in social justice, starched in, uh, in community uh, of, of building, um, uh, in social uh, engagement. And, um, and I can't say that the black church is dead or even on life support, uh, that I believe in, in places and spaces that the black church is alive and thriving. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another question. Um, Sharon is submitting this question from Veronica Newman. Uh, what is Dr. Burrell's take on how people digest or consume theological information in our social media technology age? Information is being shared in, uh, in sound bites because of many people's lack. Uh, hold on. I got some of the question. In Did I lose you guys? Oh. Can you, do you still have me, Marcus? Yeah, yeah, you're still here. Okay. okay. I'm trying to get back to that question. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Can you, do okay. you still have me, Marcus? Yeah, yeah, you're still here. Okay. Okay, so the rest of that question was, um, information is being shared in sound bites because of many people's lack of focus. We're overwhelmed with content these days. Should theological communication writings evolve to appeal to younger populations, or should we get younger populations more into the traditional way of communicating or sharing information? Well, probably both of those, Veronica. <clears throat> um, but even more so, in my opinion, the latter. Uh, it would be a great thing <laughs> to have young people to really begin doing uh, some reading. I, I, my, my sense these days is that very many of them need first to learn how to write. Uh, because unfortunately, with all of the 
advances in communications and all of that. It's not being taught in the schools, you know, junior high, high school, college. They aren't being taught how to read and write, really. And I hear some of these people talking and read some of their work, and they can't even write a complete sentence. Um, you know, the, the sound bites, I think, are too many. The information is coming too quickly, uh, too fast uh, for most young folk to uh, really get into uh, what they need to, to really understand uh, what's being said. So the emphasis these days with the technology seems to be on uh, quickness and how fast we can get the information out there and forget whether or not it can be adequately digested. And that's a real problem, uh, not only for me, but it's going to become a real problem for the country and really for the world yeah. uh, if we don't uh, catch up really to the technology. I mean, that's what needs to happen. Uh, we need to catch up with the technology, and we really do need to start forcing our young people, like the age of my grandbaby, Baylor, for example, uh, who will be 12 pretty soon, I believe, but forcing them to write. If they don't do a lot of it in school, it becomes mommy and daddy's responsibility to teach them. Otherwise, we're going to have a, a whole generation, really, of people who just can't communicate. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Marcus, did you want to add to that? If not, I'll go to the next question. Um, I, I see some other great questions. Uh, I, I do think uh, that, uh, that that both and uh, are needed, but um, I, I think reading is being done. I think Social media is uh, a demon in essence at times with the sound bites, but I think reading uh, definitely needs to be uh, more. All right, thank you. I'm gonna go to this next question from Pastor uh, Isaac Lane. He says, I'm interested in Dr. Burrell's writing and reading habits. Oh, can I respond to this one? <laughs> I, okay, I'm gonna start and then I'll, I'll pass it to you, okay? Um, Pastor Lane. <laughs> Dr. Burrow gets up in the morning <laughs> with not with a book in his hand, but one within reach. Okay. And Dr. Burrow starts his, his routine early in the morning. Uh, and typically you can count on him being in his office for at least uh, 12 or more hours a day, writing and reading, reading and writing. And uh, when I'm talking, when I say writing, I'm talking about consistently writing. Um, I've seen him write through some of the hardest times in his life. And I've seen him with a book, no matter where we are, where we're going, what we're doing, he's reading and writing. Um, so that's his, um, that's his reading and writing habits every day. All, and, and it's not, uh, I don't think I've seen him take a day off from reading and writing in in quite a long time. Um, so I'll, I'll pass to you, uh, Rufus, you want to catch now? <laughs> yeah, Pastor, remember what I said to uh, Marcus <clears throat> about the experience I had with James Cohn and what Professor Cohn recommended to me, uh, who at the time was, I was in my mid 20s uh, as a new seminary professor uh, when he encouraged me to write and convinced me as to why it was important uh, to write. Uh, and what I discovered, of course, was not only did writing become a discipline, by which I mean, it became a habit. And you know, like anything that has become a habit, it's like it's second nature to you, okay? It's who you are, it's what you do. You don't really have to stop and think about it a whole lot it's like learning how to tie your tie or learning how to tie your shoe. You don't have to look at how you tie that tie every day or tie your shoes every day. It's become a habit. Your hands know what to do. I know what to do when I enter 
the torture chamber. <laughs> and that's what James Baldwin used to call the, the room in his uh, apartment where he did his writing. Because writing is sort of like preparing a sermon to, pre uh, to preach. It's torturous if you do it right. And yet it's joyous at the same time. And so even though it's torturous, the joy pulls you on every time you go into the place where you do that work. So it has to become a habit. And, um, you know, I, one of the things I, I like to think about from time to time, uh, when I remember my daughter and her growing up, and uh, Sharon was always a reader. And I know that she picked that habit up from her parents. Her mom, who was a medical doctor, her mother was a reader. And of course her father, was a reader. So as a little girl, Sharon always read before bed, bedtime, uh, when she didn't have other things uh, to do, she would read. If she was sent on an errand, had to go to the store and had to stand in a long line, she always had a book in a pocketbook, in a purse. And she'd pull out that book and start reading. And I saw her do that throughout her childhood. It became habit. And of course, I'm hopeful that my granddaughter will pick up on that as well. To keep reading and to not just read, you pastors out there, to not just read devotional stuff. Right. That fluffy, soft stuff. Read something from time to time, at least once a week. Yeah. That's going to challenge the mind that God gave you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Marcus, you have another question and then I will close it out. It's 8.06. Uh, we want to be as close to faithful to our time. Y'all drop in the comments if y'all would like to do this again. If y'all would like to hear from Dr. Burl again, uh, drop it in the comments and, and I'll do my best to uh, try to get him to commit to another conversation. Yeah, so uh, my last question is, you've talked about uh, Cone, and, and I think that needs to be the next conversation, the Reverend Dr. James Hall Cone. Um, the number one Cone book that you would recommend to any preacher, lay person on uh, this, uh, this Zoom uh, uh, meeting tonight, what will be the number one James Cone book? That you his very Two. first Two. book his very first book everybody who was anybody yeah. among black pastors and church leaders yeah. ought to read black theology and black power yes okay and I say that as the first one not because it was the first one but because it's there that this young energetic and as he characterized himself a number of times, the angriest black theologian in the country. Yes, sir. It's there that he began laying the groundwork for what became his black theology. And then the, the second one I'd recommend that people read is the last one. That I wasn't going to tell nobody. And this, of course, was uh, the memoir that uh, Professor Cohn writes just before he, he dies, and of course the book is published posthumously. But it's a great read, and uh, you know one gets a real good sense of the journey of this black theologian, you know, from the early days until his demise. Said I wasn't going to tell him, nobody. All right, Dr. Burrow, I know that I said, uh, a court, you know, we were done, but, you know, I think you might want this question. Lawrence Burnley, you want a question from <laughs> Dr. Okay. Burnley was one of my students at CTS, one of the early students. 
Well, he has a question that might uh, actually uh, really encourage us to have another conversation because his his question is uh, is a uh, thesis in itself. So <laughs> I'll read it to you. The black church continues to not take seriously the need teach African Africana black history. Our voices narratives continues to be marginalized if not absent in core curricula from K terminal degrees. Why hasn't the black church, there are several exceptions of course, taken this seriously. It's a battle against systemic racism that we continue to lose. So that's why? Good, no, that's a, that's a good question, Larry, that <clears throat> I think is unanswerable in this setting this evening. Uh, <clears throat> listen. When James Cone uh, said to me that uh, black scholars, religious scholars did not write enough, I know that he was saying a lot more to me and that all of that had to do with intellectual kinds of things. To learn about our history from <clears throat> uh, the motherland from Africa uh, to the present uh, requires a good deal of hard work and discipline. We don't have the discipline to do it for one thing, and we don't have the interest to do it for another thing. And I know that to be the case uh, because of what happens, for example, uh, in churches in Sunday school, in Bible study groups. You know, I mean, those are all areas in which we could do some of the type of teaching that you're talking about, Larry, but then it would require people in the group, in the church, who know enough about that part of our history to actually do uh, the teaching and then to have the interest in you know, uh, doing that teaching in a church-like setting. Mm -hmm. So I would say, Larry, that <clears throat> You know, since the process has to begin somewhere, and you're absolutely right, it is a problem. But since the problem has to begin somewhere, one thing that could happen uh, on the academic side, even at the University of Dayton, where you are, you know, somebody could talk the administration, the faculty, the dean, uh, into establishing something like, something like an African American church studies and other African American studies, Africana at the university. And even if it were a one of those types of uh, situations, you participated in the Midwest Christian Training Center. I know you remember at Light of the World Christian Church. It could be one of those programs that only meets on a weekend, on a Saturday, mm -hmm. for which students would get academic credit. And of course, you know, with that, you know, more students, black students especially, but all students, you know, would get credit, academic credit for attending that type of, um, that type of program. You know, about a, for about, a, I don't know what, eight to 16 week period of time. Mm -hmm. And then give them a certificate or something. And, you know, hopefully some of those students would be affiliated with churches right. so that they then could take it back to the churches. Right. Hopefully some of them would be students who are interested in pastoring churches or becoming ministers. Okay. All right. So we know that uh, academic institutions generally, <laughs> generally, do not do that kind of teaching either, Larry, but it does have to start somewhere. And if I was still at a place like CTS, for example, and you would ask me that question, it really would be my responsibility to begin looking into ways that even that white seminary could contribute to helping to solve that issue. 
That's all for now, Larry. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if Reggie is listening in too, and if he well, sends a question. You have um, Willie Newton, Willie J. Newton, that says, hello, Dr. Burrow. No question from him right now, because they'll call the house anyway. <laughs> so. okay. All right. But I believe uh, Reverend Marcus has something to add to that, and then we are going to try to close this out because I hear your voice fading. So we want to get you, let you rest. I think to Dr. Burnley's, uh, to, to his question, why isn't uh, the Black church uh, concerned about teaching uh, that Africana, African, and Black history? Um, I think James Cone answered it best. I remember watching uh, Tavis Smiley did the uh, State of the Black uh, Church uh, in the early 2000s, and, and Cone was on there and asked this question, what is the Black church doing? Uh, and Cone uh, specifically said that the Black church uh, has been instrumental in creating some of the best preachers. He specifically said, I believe that the church has created the best preachers. We're interested in singing and have produced some of the best singing or singers. Uh, but then he says, but we've not been interested in doing anything else other than that. And the church must pivot. Uh, Pastor Lane is on here. And that's one of the greatest things that he said that we ought to take seriously in this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Pivoting to the crucial points and places that the church needs to focus on. And I think this is a great time for the black church to kind of re revitalize itself, to refine, to rejuvenate, to revive itself into being what God has called us to be. And Cone said this some 20 years ago. And it's still a mandate that I think we as a black church needs to do. Uh, and that's to pivot and to find, reclaim our voice and revive ourselves. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Somehow the critique though has to come from within, within yes. first. Yes. Yeah. Which means that pastors like yourself even yeah. have got to challenge those senior pastors, including your senior pastor. Yes, sir. And you know, the pastor won't want to hear it, but you know, you know he didn't call you. God called you. So that's where it has to begin. And we learned that from nobody better than we learned it from Martin Luther King, yeah. who, as I said before, was always yeah. seeking his brothers yeah. in ministry. Yeah. Something that the police departments across the country can't do. Well, I want to thank you so much, both of you, uh, our conversationalists for this evening, uh, Reverend Marcus Derek White and Dr. Rufus Burrow Jr. I appreciate you both for sharing this evening. Um, Willie Newton Jr. added, it takes enlightened leaders to provide cognitive development to the black church. Absolutely. Um, Timothy Knight, I know he was listening. Uh, Pastor Greg Allen, my son in love. He he and Brandy were on here listening as well. You, we've had quite a few people listening, and they are asking for you to do this again. So we will uh, we'll make sure that we do this again. We will uh, post to Facebook and and let you know when it's coming. Maybe we'll we'll talk about James Cone next time and get a little deeper Black Liberation theology. Uh, or, or we may, you know, do something different, but uh, I'm sure whatever it be, that we'll we'll enjoy it. So tell them we'll do like the good pastor and pass the hat. We'll <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So I appreciate you all for joining us on a Friday night. Um, I thank you all, Facebook family and friends, and God bless you. Uh, please make sure that you visit www.reconciliationandequity.com. That's uh, www.reconciliationandequity.com. That's Building Reconciliation, Inclusion, Diversity, Gender Equity website for more information or continue to follow us at Reconciliation and Equity. God bless you all and hope to see you real soon. <laughs>